Yeah, so my name is Adelbert Chang. I am a software engineer at Target where I work on the inventory positioning and control team, uh, supply, chain, supply chain optimization kind of stuff. And today I want to talk to you guys about uh, something that's been on my mind ever since essentially I took my role at Target, uh, where I'm now working more in a sort of systems and infrastructure space and am being asked to think about uh, a lot of these core systems that our team is using. So infrastructure is a very rapidly growing area, which makes it uh, simultaneously really exciting, but also kind of uh, overwhelming. Uh, from all these different new technologies, from containers to cluster schedulers to service mesh to service meshes to serverless, uh, it's very hard to keep track of sort of what the lay of the landscape is going day to day, week to week, month to month, sort of figuring out what's hot, what's new, what's trendy, what's what are AWS and GCP and all these new cloud, uh, all these established cloud companies sort of trending towards. And uh, while we do have a lot of this popular technology that a lot of people are going to be talking about, blogging about, uh, speaking about, we do want to, as engineers, want to figure out how much of this is marketing and how much of it is sort of technical excellence, right? And so when we go to some of these websites, these can be kind of hard to um, evaluate. And of course, when you do go to these websites, these splash pages are going to often be targeted towards to draw you in as, as much as possible. But as engineers, we're trying to sort of get at uh, what the differences between these systems are as opposed to maybe what sounds trendy at the moment and what will be trendy uh, in uh, what will change in like three months, six months, a year. So I pulled some examples from popular open source infra technologies. Uh, so this page is going to be about cluster schedulers. So I went to the Kubernetes website. Kubernetes starts off with, uh, Kubernetes is an open source system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. Uh, tells us a little bit if we're just looking for, say, if we're a company that's putting everything in containers and we want to deploy it somewhere, sounds solid so far. But doing our due diligence, maybe we go to a competitor's website, and we see Nomad is an easy to use, flexible, and performant workload orchestrator that can deploy a mix of microservice, batch, containerized, and non-containerized applications. Since we're maybe in a containerized world, uh, maybe the non-containerized part isn't really relevant to us, but like so far between Kubernetes and Nomad, it can be hard to tell what exactly the differences are, why we should choose one or the other. Uh, certainly maybe Kubernetes is more highly marketed, but maybe Nomad is a more mature product. And then for completeness sake, maybe we go to the Mesos website. Mesos abstracts CPU, memory, storage, and other compute resources away from machines, enabling fault-tolerant and elastic distributed systems to easily be built and run effectively. So just looking at these three, which are all in sort of the same domain, it can be very hard to figure out, okay, what, if I'm being asked to choose a cluster schedule for my team, I want to be sure to choose the one that's going to last beyond however long this Kubernetes hype is going to go on or however long uh, the current state of my orgs and infra is going to uh, go on. So, uh, so far, pretty hard to tell what the difference is. This, uh, these examples also apply to other domains, right? not just cluster schedulers. If we look inside this sort of service mesh space, we can see Linkerd is an ultralight service mesh for Kubernetes. Gives a little bit of information. Gives you observability, reliability, and security without requiring any code changes. Sounds awesome to me, right? For completeness, we go to Istio's website. Uh, Istio makes it easy to create a network of deployed services with load balancing, service-to-service -service authentication, monitoring, and more with few or no code changes in service code. And so, so this Istio one isn't even from the front page, right? I actually dug into the docs a little bit to get this blurb because the one on the front page was actually even a little bit more vague than this. But these two are essentially the, the exact same statement, right? Both of them are giving you observability monitoring. Uh, they're both giving you reliability load balancing, and they're both giving you security, service-to-service -service authentication, both being both advertising that you can do to all of this without requiring any code changes. So just look at these descriptions. Can't really tell what's happening. And not to rag on just like these sort of cloud native uh, infrastructure technologies, even products I work on are guilty of this too. So uh, for those of you who are here last year at Scale by the Bay, I gave a talk on this continuous deployment system called Nelson. And on the front page of the Nelson's website, uh, Nelson fuses years of field experience with rigorous formal methods to, prove a, to provide a continuous delivery system that just works. Users are empowered to focus on building their products whilst operators can guarantee that applications are meeting the organizational best practices. Lots of little marketing speak there. Uh, it doesn't really give us a whole amount of detail. We sort of have to dig through the docs to get a bit more information. Uh, maybe a competing product, Spinnaker. Uh, Spinnaker is an open source, multi-cloud, continuous delivery platform for releasing software changes with high velocity and confidence. Created at Netflix, it has been battle tested in production by hundreds of teams over millions of deployments. It combines a powerful and flexible pipeline management system with integrations to the major cloud providers. And my point here really 
is that across schedulers, across these service meshes, across these continuous deployment systems, even across like container runtimes, there's a lot of effort being put into marketing, uh, which is not a bad thing, right? The landscape is huge. Uh, marketing push can be hard to dig through, and this is not necessarily bad because market forces are certainly a factor that people should consider when adopting technologies. Uh, for instance, the sheer momentum behind Kubernetes has led to the adoption of, or the existence of systems like EKS, like GKE, like AKS, where your organization can just sort of throw money at these public cloud companies and you get a managed cluster for free. Whereas that same kind of momentum wouldn't be behind uh, necessarily other cluster schedulers. For instance, you don't, we don't really have the same level of like AWS GCP adoption as say Nomad, right? So market forces certainly are a factor to consider. My focus on this talk is uh, to not just consider these market forces, but also to sort of look not just at the technical differences between these competing products, but also to understand their technical capabilities and limitations over the long run beyond sort of the trend, right? Trends are sort of this illusion that are really being pushed onto us uh, constantly. And they're an illusion, they come and go, technical capabilities tend to stick around, organizations, organizational challenges tend to stick around, right? What's hot today isn't gonna be hot in six months, isn't gonna be hot in a year. So what my focus for this talk is gonna be is, are there principles we can use to evaluate systems against each other, right? Even though we can, even when we do try to dig through a docs and we can get a, we can enumerate a list of maybe what Nelson does well or what Spinnaker does well or what Linkerd does well, um, it would be nice if we had sort of, maybe not a formal set of rules, but at least some set of principles we can use to sort of check, check our math, make sure everything looks okay, make sure everything's aligned with what we need for our work. And um, for me, uh, especially in my sort of previous stint as a sort of systems researcher uh, several years back, I believe there are these principles. If we are indeed willing to go back 15 years, and actually as I was writing these slides, I realized that even though 15 plus years sounds like a long time, that's really just like mid 2000s, which is, which is kind of surprising to me. So I'm gonna take us not back 15, plus, not just 15 plus years, but actually take us back 30 or 40 years back to uh, whatever this diagram is. Who, does anyone know what this represents? Who actually knows what this diagram is? One, that's the internet, right. So this is uh, back then called an ARPANET. Uh, this is a diagram from around 1969. This was uh, sort of the first, I guess, live deployment of like a, uh, distributed system, I guess, right? Separate, geographically separated components trying to talk to each other. Uh, I am a little proud to say that that third node on the left there, UCSB, is my alma mater, but uh, that's all I say about that. Uh, but so during this mo during this era where we are now we now have this like we're moving beyond just having focusing on a single system and focusing on and moving this towards this trend of geographically distributed uh, nodes, there were a lot of design questions for distributed systems that might. Uh, might not be as applicable today or might be taken for granted today, but uh, the principles that arose from them, I believe still hold today. So some of the questions that came out of the design of ARPANET and what is now the internet are questions around how do we do reliable delivery? How do, we, how do I make sure the bits from UCSB arrive at SRI in the way I, I want them to? How do I do congestion control when all these geographically uh, distributed systems and separately managed systems are all trying to talk to each other at the same time? As ARPANET grew into the internet and different organizations or different states or different providers uh, had their own sort of uh, federated systems. How do we route traffic with not just within a system, like maybe uh, I'll have one way of routing traffic just within California, but also how do I then route traffic in between different, say, internet service providers, right? Which are separately managed but still need to be able to talk to each other. And this led to a lot of research, a lot of designs, a lot of systems level thinking, a lot of iterations. and. Uh, a whole bunch of papers talking about different trade-offs and different ways to think about these systems came out. Uh, three of them stand out to me and are sort of foundational papers, uh, especially in the networking space. Uh, these three papers are Hints for Computer System Design, published in 1983, Into an Arguments in System Design, published in 1984, and Tussles in Cyberspace, Defining Tomorrow's Internet, published in 2002. Um, as it turns out, it is very difficult to cover three landmark papers in 30 minutes, now 20 minutes, and I made the same mistake two years ago when I tried to cover three things in the span of 20 minutes. It did not end well. Uh, so what I'm gonna do today is, instead of trying to go in depth and, and sort of cover them, as like go deep into them, I'm just gonna try to take out one lesson from each of these papers and apply it to a modern system today to sort of get people thinking, hopefully get you guys thinking about how 
despite these papers being 30, 40 years old, how they can apply to even modern systems today. Uh, I do want to say that these papers contain more than one lesson. Uh, there's no way I'm going to cover any of these papers, even, I couldn't, I don't think I could do any of these papers justice covering just one of them in the time I have left. So I encourage, if you are interested, to read them, uh, come up to me after the talk to chat about them. Uh, but in the interest of time, I am just going to take one lesson from each, apply to a system, and then move on. Um, I want to, before I get into, into that, I do want to open with a direct quote from the first paper I'm going to cover, hints from computer system design. Uh, so this paper is basically lays out several hints that, or several sort of principles that the author has sort of experienced in iterating across different systems, not just networking systems, but also just single systems or designing programming languages uh, across different fields. Uh, so he starts off with, these are not novel, foolproof recipes, laws of system design or operation, precisely formulated, consistent, always appropriate, approved by all the leading experts or guaranteed to work. And I think the same disclaimer holds to this talk. Uh, personally, everything I'm about to say, I believe in. Uh, these are opinions that I hold, but maybe your opinions differ. Uh, but that's fine. I think my goal here is just to get the conversation going and to begin evaluating systems along these different axes, which I think uh, sometimes are not given the attention they are due. So we'll start with the 1983 paper, Hints for Computer System Design. It starts off with a mantra which I think a lot of people will often uh, espouse. Keep it simple, do one thing at a time, do it well kind of like the Unix philosophy, kind of uh, maybe a more, slightly more modern version, maybe is keep it, sim keep it simple stupid. Uh, kind of vague, so we can go a little bit deeper. A couple paragraphs down. S the service must have a fairly predictable cost. The interface must not promise more than the implementer knows how to deliver. This starts getting a little bit more interesting. I think especially uh, if you're an engineer in industry, this will s particularly speak to you if you've ever had like a product manager suddenly say, oh, we have this one client who really wants this nice, this like edge case feature that like no one else really wants, but like it'd be really cool if we had this, or uh, just trying to like sort of makes you leak the abstraction a little bit just so you can support maybe just one or two or three other customers. Uh, the quote continues on, especially it should not promise features needed only by a few clients, like I just said, unless the implementer knows how to provide them without penalizing others. And finally, it ends with make it fast rather than general or powerful. I think oftentimes uh, it can be very easy or as, uh, especially within a programming language, we're taught to say, oh, write really generic functions, which are great, but maybe in a systems world, if you really need to sacrifice speed to make it marginally more general, think twice about that. Uh, so there's trouble with slow, powerful operations is that the client who doesn't want the power pays more for the basic function. Now, uh, this sort of, this block, these three quotes, um, when I think of this paper and when I rewrite this paper sort of in the past couple of years, the first thing I think of is sort of this distinction between uh, HashiCorp and other products which I'll get into. So uh, who here is familiar with HashiCorp products uh, or has used, yeah, yeah. Uh, so HashiCorp is, is the company probably best known for Terraform. Maybe their second best known product would be Console and they also uh, run Nomad which is a scheduler and Vault which is uh, sort of a secret security solution. And what HashiCorp, I think, does a really good job of doing is all of the systems they build are completely usable independently. They all have a very focused goal. And while there are nice integrations between them, plenty of people, and it's completely possible to use them completely ignoring the other products, right? A lot of people use Terraform and without using Console, Vault, or Nomad. That's a completely doable thing. It plugs into several backends, AWS, OpenStack, whatever you want. Uh, for uh, products like Vault and Console, you will see a lot of companies use Console as their service discovery solution or as their uh, leader election solution. And they have tool chains like Console Template, which are designed, which are just a simple binary you pull down, you point at your Console cluster and you can, uh, and it works. You don't have to be deployed in Nomad in order to use Console. You don't have to be in a specific environment to use Vault. Everything is completely usable independently. And uh, especially to my point about uh, that last part where make it fast as opposed to general or powerful, uh, one of the things that this, one of the products they build that I think really speaks to this is Nomad. So HashiCorp Nomad is literally just a scheduler. Console is just a key value store and Vault is just about security. And because, no, because they have very focused goals, they're able to make Nomad really good at just scheduling. Right? Nomad is in a business of helping you do service discovery or helping you mount storage or helping you uh, store secrets. It's just Given, give me a pool of resources, tell me what to schedule, what I need, and I'll do it as fast as possible. 
And if you go to their website, you can see them actually bragging about they are comfortable scheduling 1 million containers across 5,000 hosts in just under five minutes. And this is a number they are comfortable advertising. So let's contrast this with another system that I believe is maybe at the opposite end or, not, or a little bit towards the powerful end compared to HashiCorp products, and that's Kubernetes. So Kubernetes has taken uh, the industry by storm. But one of the big issues I have with Kubernetes, at least philosophically, is Kubernetes wants to do everything for you. It really wants to be your service discovery solution, it wants to be your scheduler, and wants to do storage for you, it wants to do auto scaling for you, and wants to do secrets and config management for you. And it does provide a happy path, and so long as you sort of fit their happy path, you're probably good. Or if you're within some uh, scale limit, then you're probably good. But if you want to sort of diverge from it, if you want to maybe say use Kubernetes with an existing console deployment, or you want to use uh, Kubernetes but have your own ingress solution, things start to get a little bit tricky. And I think uh, I don't really have, I confess I don't really have hard evidence to back this claim, but it would be not surprising if because Kubernetes is trying to do so much for you that that's limited how much uh, speed they're willing to advertise. So if you go to the Kubernetes uh, website, you can see that they have a hard limit on they only support 5,000 nodes. This, used, this number used to be 2,000. I was actually going to put 2,000. I think it's only recently became 5,000. Meanwhile, uh, Nomad is comfortable just bragging about 5,000 nodes. I'm sure Nomad can scale beyond that. Another, limit, another hard limit they have that they advertise is they can only uh, do 300,000 containers. Meanwhile, Nomad is bragging about scheduling 1 million containers. Right? Nomad is, is very focused on saying, I'm going to schedule, and that's all. Whereas Kubernetes, while it, it is more powerful, people who maybe don't need all that power are paying this cost that they can now only scale to 5,000 nodes or they can only scale to 300,000 containers. And if you need, if maybe you don't need all this fanciness behind uh, storage orchestration or service discovery, but you want to deploy like a lot of containers, then like you sort of need to figure out how to, do, how to work your way around that. So uh, again, I'm not claiming that necessarily that Kubernetes cannot sk reach the same scales as Nomad, but I do believe that because not just Nomad, but just HashiCorp products in general are very focused. That lets them optimize for the fast case and the general case uh, much better than a complicated system like Kubernetes. So second paper that I want to cover is end to end argument in system design. This was published in 1984. Uh, this was a networking paper. Uh, it starts off with, uh, in a system, it becomes apparent that there's a list of functions, each of which might be implemented in any of several ways, by the communication subsystem, by its client, as a joint venture, or perhaps redundantly, each doing its own version. And to give a little bit of context, uh, this paper was primarily, I believe, inspired by uh, reliable delivery in TCP. And so one example you can think of is, uh, how do I make sure uh, the bits I want to send from machine A to machine B get there uh, correctly? And uh, sort of the, the gist of this is maybe the communication substrate can provide that functionality, but really it's correctness at the application level that matters, right? Uh, sort of the maybe more pessimistic view is even if your bits make it over the wire, uh, you still need those bits to go from your, your NIC to your actual application correctly for things to matter, right? If it makes it over the wire, but it's, it gets corrupted between the NIC and the actual application, then like there's no use. You have to retransmit anyways. So that's sort of what inspired this paper. Uh, this paper goes on to say, the function in question can completely, can completely and correctly be implemented only with the knowledge and help of the application standing at the endpoints. So the actual application level concerns, not just the, the routers or uh, switches in between. Sometimes an incomplete version of the function provided by the communication system may be useful as a performance enhancement. And while I think the first sentiment is very important, I think the second sentiment bears uh, emphasis. So. Uh, some other examples to sort of give you uh, some bearings about what else they may be talking about is you can think about end-to-end -end, end -end encryption, right? I could, you could, if you imagine internet where maybe, say, Comcast or some other internet service provider tells you that we're going to encrypt traffic flowing through between your cell phone, to, between your router and someone else's router, right? But that involves us trusting Comcast or involves us trusting some sort of middleman. And to really, really, if you wanted like absolute certainty that your stuff was encrypted, that needs to happen end to end. Um, and so one of, the thing, one of the sort of trade offs that this paper is talking about is even if your ISP or some communication substrate were to implement, say, encryption for you, you would still want to implement your own encryption if you wanted sort of the full, complete, correct version of it. And now the downside is uh, you now have two, you're now being encrypted twice, right? Even if we, because we don't trust 
the communication substrate, we are encrypting once, we are paying the cost of encrypting once on the application end, and then we're, being, we're paying the cost again to encrypt at the networking layer. Uh, so, this is so the paper is essentially sort of describing this trade-off here. Uh, and the modern version of this, I think, uh, is sort of this pattern of this, this recent notion of sidecar patterns. Who here is familiar with this notion of sidecar or even just service meshes? So uh, this became popular with the advent of cluster schedulers where, and uh, containers as well. Essentially, the idea is that you want to deploy a container. Uh, the hope is that you are able to deploy a container that just focuses on its application. It emits logs on a standard out. And it, it emits metrics on some port. And then there's some other container called the sidecar that's sitting next to your container whose sole job is to do sort of organizational or administrative tasks like uh, capturing the standard out from your container and forwarding it to some log aggregation service or capturing the metrics and forwarding it to some metrics ingestion pipeline. Uh, and oftentimes these sidecar patterns, or another example that I'm actually going to get into is uh, reverse proxies. So systems like uh, Envoy is probably the most trendy one right now. Uh, Nginx and HAProxy are probably uh, have similar products. And oftentimes these sort of sidecars are often marketed to provide functionality quote unquote for free. Right? We saw earlier in the sort of splash page of like Linkerd and Istio that they would provide observability, security, and uh, I forget, and monitoring. Uh, without any code changes, right? So this is often how these things are uh, are being advertised. And if you sort of think about it, this is very similar to the reliable and secure transmission uh, examples that inspired the paper. Provide some functionality inside the substrate, and uh, in theory, your application should just be able to emit quote unquote like dumb messages or do just focus on what it actually wants to do and trust the substrate to do it. But uh, as the end to end, as the end, -to -end paper. Uh, uh, argues, the you can only really implement these features completely and correctly at the application level, right? Uh, while you can provide, while for some things you might be you might be willing to trust, say, the substrate to do like log aggregation, you probably don't want your applications always like every time you write an application to like write a connector to Splunk or something, or every time you emit metrics to write a connector to Influx. Uh, so for some of these sidecars, I think actually makes sense. But for stuff like maybe reverse proxies, where they often will advertise themselves as, oh, your application can just emit sort of dumb HTTP requests to this proxy, and this, and this proxy will just transparently handle retries and exponential backoff and all that good stuff for you. That's cool, but if you need to retry based on something other than, say, the HTTP header, where you actually need to maybe parse something, and if something doesn't look right in the actual semantics of the message that you're getting, then the fact that you need to, even though the message got there sort of correctly, to return a quote unquote 200 according to the reverse proxy, you have to retry anyways. And this is very similar to the analog of reliable transmission, right? This is basically the exact same thing as reliable transmission. And again, because this, uh, this retry mechanism is now implemented both in the application layer and also in the networking substrate, you pay this cost twice. Now, does that mean that the reverse, all reverse proxies are useless? No. It just means that when you're evaluating these uh, reverse proxy solutions or these service mesh solutions that are providing a lot of this functionality, quote unquote, for free, or even all these uh, advertised platform as, platform as a service systems, you make sure that you are okay with this trade off. That A, uh, should you need to implement uh, your own version of it, that either you are okay to pay the cost or there is some sort of escape hatch where you don't have to pay the cost of the implementation in the substrate. And if you are willing to, say, trust the substrate, then be okay with knowing that you, for things like maybe retries or for other things that need more richer or semantic information, that you just won't be able to do those. Which is a perfectly fine thing to say. I am just trying to, the paper and I am just trying to say, be aware that this is the trade-off that's happening and don't be sort of blinded by the marketing talk of, oh, you get this functionality for free without any code changes. There are trade-offs here. So uh, that's the end-to-end -end argu argument. I am going to move on to our third and last paper. Uh, this is a paper called Tussle in Cyberspace Defining Tomorrow's Internet. This was published in 2002. Uh, the sort of takeaway message from this paper is design for variation in outcome. Do not design so as to dictate the outcome. Rigid designs will be broken. Designs that permit variation will flex under pressure and survive. Modularize the design along Tussle boundaries so that one Tussle does not spill over and distort unrelated issues. Design for choice to permit the different players to express their preferences. Uh, and the systems that think that I think of first when I read uh, when I read this paper are this recent trend again in 
uh, control planes and these continuous deployment solutions and in service meshes. Uh, some control planes will tie themselves to a system, right? So I don't know if it actually is tied, but at least on the splash page, Linkerd, uh, which is a service mesh, and uh, Argo, which is a workflow engine, are their Linkerd is a service mesh for Kubernetes. Argo is a service is a workflow solution for Kubernetes, and that's great if you are willing to put all of your money on Kubernetes. But personally, for me, while Kubernetes is really hot right now, I'm willing to bet that it's not going to be hot in five years or in ten years. And if your organization is willing to make that bet, then that's cool. But uh, this is just something to be cognizant of. And so the point here is infrastructure is rapidly growing. Try to design your systems not so that they're tied to whatever is trendy at the time, but try to make, it, make what your system is actually doing uh, separate from what the sort of data plane is going to do. And so one example is going to be uh, a system that I work on called Nelson. Nelson is a automated deployment uh, system that does sort of uh, version immutable deployment. So real quick, just to give some context, um, imagine a service graph with uh, versions attached to them. Whereas oftentimes when we want to deploy a new version of a service, what would happen is the new version just in place replaces the old version, right? So if we deploy 2.2.0, uh, where 2.1.8 currently lives will eventually become 2.2.0 and the whole system just sees a new version. Uh, what Nelson does is it actually deploys two dot, uh, that new version in a completely separate location. So now we have two versions of D running. And in order for the rest of the system to sort of catch up or to upgrade, uh, they are expected to deploy a new version of themselves and explicitly declare instead of, uh, so E used to depend on 2.1.8, E is going to redeploy a new version of itself and then explicitly say, I now depend on version 2.2.0 of D. And this continues on uh, until eventually uh, the graph looks like that. And then as the system sort of stabilizes and converges, Nelson has a garbage collection mechanism for figuring out what are old deprecated services, deletes the old versions, and finally the graph is left like this. So Nelson has a very clear goal. Its focus is on immutable version deployments. Does not really care what the scheduler it's communicating with is. Doesn't really care what exact uh, secret solution it's using. Doesn't really care what exactly service discovery solution it's using. Right? It just wants some way to deploy a versioned thing and wants some way of informing different versions of uh, discovering specific versions of other systems. And it has some notion of a garbage collection policy. And the way Nelson's design very explicitly reifies this, right? The main, when you start up Nelson, it starts up, let's see, three, four, five, seven? Yeah. It starts up seven uh, sort of background jobs. Each group have a very specific task. Uh, the main ones are sort of the pipeline processor, which is the thing that actually deploys it onto a scheduler. Then we have the routing cron, which is responsible for service discovery between uh, specific versions of deployment. And then we have the cleanup pipeline and the sweeper, which are responsible for uh, the garbage collection. And uh, what happened is, so this is a real thing that happened about two years ago. Nelson used to support, uh, as backends, specifically HashiCorp Nomad, HashiCorp Console, and uh, HashiCorp Vault. Then I came along and I said, well, I want to use this for Kubernetes. But I was sort of uh, scared that, well, how much is Nelson tied to sort of being all in on this, on this HashiCorp business? And as it turns out, it was not really that tied in. I literally had to just implement the scheduler portion where I could teach Nelson, this is how you schedule something on a Kubernetes. And all the other service discovery and uh, garbage collection mechanisms continue to work. And if you go find, uh, you can go to the Nelson GitHub and find this PR. And you'll see that I, pretty, I mostly just changed the schedule implementation. And I didn't really have to touch anything else. And we've had other people who say, well, my org actually wants to use uh, GitLab instead of GitHub. Or my org wants to use uh, AWS load balancers as opposed to uh, something that's console based or something. Um, and they are able to implement those without touching the rest of the system. And despite the fact that Nelson was developed several years ago, for Verizon, the, due to the way the system is architected, we're very comfortable sort of shifting with the flow of whatever is trendy, whatever is hot, whatever your organization needs. And so I think um, I'm biased because I work on it, but I think Nelson sort of espouses a really, at least a, a decent example of what it means to design for Tussle and not to design for a specific concrete uh, outcome. So uh, my takeaways. Uh, the tech may be different between the 1980s and now. ARPANET certainly was much smaller compared to the internet and serverless worlds that we have today. But I believe the core principles remain the same and are still applicable. Systems design principles from the 1980s are still applicable. Uh, in the era of rapidly evolving and heavily marketed systems, we need these principles to guide us to make good decisions. And to finish off, 
Uh, I hope your systems are simple, correct, fast, and tussle resilient. That's all I have for today. I don't think we have time for questions, but feel free to come up to me and find me in the halls and yeah, chat.